Okay, great, let's go. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us here after the first session after lunch. I'm excited to say that um, the first in the news session, we, we, it's, a, it's a kind of irregular format that we, uh, that we um, use um, with, um, with care only when necessary. I think um, the one in June, are, uh, the two days after the UK decision to leave the EU was uh, the last time we had such a session. I think this time it's, um, it's equally pertinent and equally relevant. This in the news session is about after the election. Here to uh, joined um, by a very, very um, um, well qualified panel to discuss this. Um, to my immediate left, Susan Nora Johnson, Vice Chair of the Brookings Institution in the USA. Doug Redeker, also a non resident senior fellow at Brookings, but um, uh, also the executive chairman of International Capital Strategies, a boutique advisory firm. Delighted to be joined by Cheryl Martin, member of the managing board of the World Economic Forum. Um, who, before joining us in, um, in the past uh, 12 months, was, uh, um, has uh, worked in the US administration as well as in the private sector. So we've got a range of views here. My only ask is that we uh, keep the discussion as much as possible on where looking forward and trying to, trying to plot a path and try to understand what happens next. The temptation is to look into the, you know, what went wrong or what went right, depending on your viewpoint. I'm sure everybody in this room and our audience online have their opinion there. I don't think we'll be able to keep a lid on that, but we, we only have half an hour, so let's try to get to the issues as soon as possible. Um, we're going to have questions from the floor, also from Facebook as well, and, and I encourage our panellists to uh, chip in and disagree with each other as, as you see fit. Susan, where were you on Tuesday evening, and what was your immediate reaction? So on Tuesday evening, uh, I was in New York, and at about 11 o'clock at night, which was still early, um, it was very clear to me that the momentum was with Trump. Uh, at that point, Pennsylvania and Michigan had not been lost yet, but it was very clear that if you looked really on a county by county basis, uh, that Trump was doing extraordinarily well. And I'd say I, I had two reactions, um, uh, other than being kind of surprised, uh, but not surprised, was that two major issues which have faced the country are now absolutely at its doorstep and it needs to deal with them. And those two issues were one, the economic divide uh, in the country, uh, and the cultural divide. And by the economic divide, what I mean by that is almost 50% of the US population lives paycheck to paycheck. Um, if you look at the population, we only have a 60% uh, labor participation rate. Uh, and it was very clear that most families would prefer security versus opportunity, which was really a shift historically in the way that Americans had thought about their opportunity. And if I looked at the cultural divide, um, I think you also saw something that finally kind of came home to roost that we've all kind of hid behind, which is there have been parts of the population that have been left behind economically very significantly. So if you look at the wage stagnation or if you look at parts of the country really where they hadn't seen any kind of growth and prosperity and you had seen major job loss, there was no question that that had uh, congregated in certain people who often were white, were often rural, were often people who had come from either union or manufacturing jobs in the past. That was no longer the case. They also had lost some of their identity, both in terms of their working life, but also their cultural life. So if you looked at some of the most important institutions that had provided some support or some substrate, such as family or church, or union, many of those ties were now gone for those people. And there's an expression that we often use in the United States called identity politics, which is, um, for the most part, often characterizes the identity politics of women or minorities or people um, who have different sexual preferences. And the reality is it's been very unacceptable for historical reasons to think that you could have a white subgroup as a kind of an identified group because of the terrible kind of racist past um, that we had all lived through. But the reality is those people don't have any other affinity group at this point. And it was very clear to me that after this election, we were going to have to deal with not just the economic situation, but how you brought those people back into um, a unified country where they felt that they were equally important. Uh, Doug, you're, part of, you're, you're DC based professional. You have a boutique advisory firm. You're, you're in the swamp as it were, but the, you know, the, those in the swamp are gonna be needed to, to, you know, to, to, to plot this path forward. There's a huge amount of, we don't know yet about what's going to happen. What's your take? Well, for those who think that this administration is gonna come in and somehow clean the swamp, uh, I, I think it's so far been at best a disappointment because while we don't know 
what this administration is going to look like. Uh, what we do know is that this is the most untested policymaking president in America's history. And those around him, for the most part, not entirely, certainly the vice president-elect, uh, Mike Pence, is of the Washington establishment. But most of those around Donald Trump have no governing experience whatsoever. And Washington, uh, whether it is a swamp as one would define it or otherwise, Washington is a complicated place. The government is an incredibly big and complicated institution. And the ability to make it work better requires you to understand just the basic understanding of, of how it's structured and, and what tools you can use to make it work better, make it work differently or otherwise. And ironically, those who are part of the problem by those who believe that you're supposed to clear out the swamp are the ones who actually know how to navigate through that swamp the best. And so there is this dilemma. Certainly President Obama, eight years ago, found himself in a different but not, not deeply dissimilar situation where coming in as a candidate of change, the first hire he made was Rahm Emanuel as his chief of staff, someone who had been part of the Washington establishment for decades. Now with Donald Trump, he faces a, an even more complicated dilemma because three weeks ago, we were talking about whether the Republican Party would break in two, there were, or, or more than two. But there was a real debate about whether the Republican Party had enough to hold it together, whether really there was so much uh, dissent within the different wings, it ought to be at least two different parties. Now, Donald Trump has to take those two wings, or let's say those at least two, probably more than two wings, and put together a cabinet and sub-cabinet and White House staff from amongst them. And we don't know where those hires are going to come from, but you can be pretty sure at least some of them will be members of, I'd say, flag-carrying members of the swamp. And so that's not a bad thing or a good thing. That's just a fact. And I think that we're going to see a lot more of a frustration being uh, heard from those who voted for Trump thinking he was going to act the way he did on his TV show which is effectively clean house by simply using the words, you're fired, uh, to actually come up against the US government, which is not prone to your fired type behavior. I think it's a real tension, and I'm not sure it's going to be resolved well in no matter what metric you're talking about. Thanks. So we're going to have time for questions, but first of all, I want to bring, bring you in, Cheryl. And, and I'm going to read a passage from a, an article Gideon Rackman from the Financial Times wrote in January this year. It is possible, if still unlikely, that when the WEF gathers this time next year, Trump will be president, the UK will have voted to leave the EU, and border controls will have been restored across Europe. These developments would turn the Davos world upside down. Maybe it wasn't so unlikely. Maybe we just missed the signs. Yeah, well, I mean, clearly, right, writing about it, there is reasons for putting those things on paper, right? And I think a lot of, we've alluded to some of them already, that some of these, these signs were there. Um, I think how seriously we took them, how sometimes we over, um, overestimated the power of the original Obama coalitions that formed through the past two elections and how fragile they were or were not to, to rally now, right? And so um, I think in the, in the Democratic Party, we have a lot of questions to look at around what, what are those underlying themes, um, what are those coalitions, who, what are these voices that were not heard? Um, but then again, agreeing on the Republican side as well, that to get any of the policies to go forward, be they the original laid out policies or these modified positions that seem to be emerging in the conversation, we're gonna to have to have tremendous um, coalition building to figure out how this is gonna work. Um, and so I think as we look at from the commentary at the FT about, about Davos and the world being different, the world's always different, right? A year, it's always different, um, different angles. I think that right now, as we look at our theme for Davos, as we, as we look to January, responsive and responsible leadership, I think it speaks to that even more, that really looking at where and how our technology issues, um, job evolution issues, national tendencies, um, immigration um, dynamics, how and why do those things call for and demand responsive and responsible leadership? Who are the voices that we are not actually bringing into the conversation? Not talking about, but talking with. 
And I think that that shift is a really big one that will take us a long way to the necessities to solve some of these problems. I think, I think Cheryl really put her hand, her hand on it when she said bringing people into the conversation. There is no question that whether you look at Brexit or the U.S. elections or some of the things that are going on in the European continent, it is a wholesale rejection of the elite. And by elite, I mean both people and power and influence uh, and also institutions. And if you look again at people's views, um, institutions failed them during the financial crisis. Uh, they've seen almost every institution of life in some way not be able to deliver. They're going through the most profound technological change probably in industrial history, and it's not going to change. And so having people kind of buy into the process, which is going to really kind of create their destiny, I think is critically important because I don't think there will be trust no matter how strong a coalition you have of kind of just the general old folks and the establishment that we used to have, that won't do it in terms of people's kind of political buy-in. It's, it's interesting we talk about coalition building when the, the narrative seems to be one of movements, the fashionable word at the moment, whether it's uh, the uh, Leave the UK, EU movement in the UK or whether it's Trump's movement or now we're talking about a new democratic movement rather than a party. So if that's an interesting one, maybe we'll come to that. But first of all, I want to just give the, everybody here in the audience a chance to uh, ask any questions they may have. Can we have a show of hands, please? Gentleman in the front row, lady on the front row afterwards. Thanks. Um, Frank Kane from the National uh, uh, Newspaper, Abu Dhabi. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get a take uh, uh, going forward on how this part of the world should view the new president, uh, because he, he's extremely hard to read, isn't he? Um, you know, from, from, from a Middle East point of view, um, he likes authoritarian rulers, but he hates Muslims. He wants to give Saudis nu nuclear weapons, uh, uh, but he's against, in he's against intervention in uh, Iraq and Syria. Uh, he doesn't want to trade deal with Iran. Is it, is it possible to uh, uh, detect any common thread of policy towards the Middle East from, from, from him? Uh, uh, again, I, I, we have talked about this. I don't think you should think about policies. I think you should think about positions that you've heard so far. And if I were going to answer your question, again, if I had to speculate, and that's all it is is speculation, that if you think about return on investment, that's how his mentality works. So whether it's NATO, whether it's Mideast engagement, whether it's engagement with Russia or China, he's going to think about what is he putting in as a sovereign and what is he getting back in return. Uh, and the more amorphous that is or the more risky that is, he's going to, again, put his return on investment calculation appropriately. Yeah. Let's just broaden that way. Sorry. Don't I was just going to say, an another way to say that is, <clears throat> you know, he's a purely tactical and transactional president. So there is no unified theory of the case for a Trump foreign policy. That doesn't mean that in any given case you couldn't find some theme, and maybe what Suzanne pointed out is that theme. But to look at the election so far and discern any foreign policy mantra would be a mistake. Because first of all, I think this is a president-elect who fundamentally believed in the dichotomy between a campaign and governing, gave zero thought to governing, and is only now coming to grips with what that might be. And as we've said and we continue to say, and I think you have to just continue to remember, his personnel choices will be the first indications of what he actually might think about, but they will not be the end of those indications because we have seen, as we saw during the campaign, this is somebody who is prone to shifts um, at a fairly rapid pace. Um, and so even making a determination of what happens in making initial policy personnel choices does not mean that's where you're going to end up weeks or months or years later. I hear what you're saying, Doug, and it's pretty hard to kind of map these things out without knowing more information. But is there any can we extrapolate any of this thinking for on the wider you know, foreign affairs geopolitical issue? For example, we know um, there's been you know, warm mood music from Russia, for example. Do we know anything about how that relationship is going to pan out? There, there's a fairly cynical approach which is widely suspected, which is, and I'm going to try and be diplomatic here, um, that there is going to be a softening of position from the United States government to what has been the Obama administration's policy on Russia. Um, what the nature of that will be, I don't know. I think you can make a non-judgmental case 
that Vladimir Putin has been frustrated by Barack Obama's emphasis on individual sovereignty of nations. So to use the example of Russia and Ukraine, the US position has been to reject Vladimir Putin's uh, pleas for a great power-like summit, where Obama and Putin and maybe Chancellor Merkel um, sit down and carve up other countries in the interests of the greater stability of their spheres of influence. And President Obama has rejected that. I don't think that President-elect Trump would be prone to rejecting that and might, in fact, embrace it, um, which is, again, maybe it is an overriding theme of foreign policy to say a great power relationship that trumps, so to speak, the individual sovereignty of nations becomes a starting point for foreign policy debate. And maybe just to extend that further, talking about Russia, if you think about the Mideast in ROI terms, uh, Russia may play a role that the U.S. doesn't want to have to play. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, again, to Doug's point, if you're thinking about what the quids are, it may very well be if Russia wants to play that role, then so be it, uh, and they'll find some other way to play a role. But again, this is all speculation, but you could see him thinking about it in those terms because the payoff to him is not obvious. Okay, let's change tack. Uh, lady in the front row. Now, uh, Jeon Moon from Arirang TV in South Korea. Now, so I'd like to ask about Donald Trump's uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. He did say at one point um, during his campaigning that he would have, he would talk with uh, Kim Jong-un over hamburgers. So I'd like to know about that. And one other question would be, this meeting is a meeting focused on future preparedness. So when it comes to uncertainties like, you know, Trump administration, how do you prepare for something so uncertain, so unpredictable? Okay, well, we've already oh. talked about the frailties of talking too much about foreign affairs, so maybe the North Korea is a difficult one for us to answer, but that's a very valid point. Preparing for a future when we don't really understand the present. Cheryl. Well, I mean, I, I think the reality is the future is always uncertain. I mean, we could take it from an from a energy technology standpoint, right? Seven years ago, we hadn't had Fukushima or the shale gas, shale gas revolution, all of the dynamics of, of OPEC. I mean, there's hundreds of dynamics in just energy that were inconceivable seven or eight years ago that are now something that we're living with, grappling with, and moving forward. And so while the, the changes at Brexit or the questions that are very valid, we know nothing really about policy in the Trump administration. We, we don't even know, I don't believe, I haven't checked my Twitter feed in an hour, but I don't think we know the chief of staff. So we don't have any indicators. So then if you step back from that and say, okay, I could throw up my hands and say, well, the whole world is uncertain and, and that's just the way it is. But you say, okay, well, you bring together people like we are here around themes and cross cuts that are very, very relevant. Right, the future of energy, the future of immigration, the future of humanitarianism. And then you start to have conversations about what are the fundamental underpinnings of those things, how are technology um, and policy going to interact with those in the future. Keeping people at the center, I think you get to a series of options and thoughts that allow you to be adaptable as the future plays out, right? and you've got groups of people from a number of perspectives as we have governments and businesses and IOs coming together where you have some, I think first, trust among these groups. And then if you have to throw a group that trusts a curveball, they trust each other so they can have a more coherent conversation about how to move forward. So I'm hoping that these global future councils as they're forming for a two year term here, become bodies that we can tap into in a lot of ways as all of this plays out to help with these adjustments and, and understanding some of those dynamics. Um, so that would at least be my excitement for what's going on here in these next two days. Doug, you had a comment, then we'll go to the gentleman in the sure, second. Well, I, I, was, I was gonna take a, a, slightly, um, a slightly more negative and pessimistic view, and, and I, I don't mean it to come off that way necessarily, but whereas uncertainty is always the baseline, um, I think that there's a heightened sense of uncertainty on the national security front internationally now with a Trump-elect administration because of some of the things he has said which call into question not just the uncertainties we're all used to, but some of the basic uh, pillars upon which global security has been based for many decades. 
And so I think it is a little bit more fraught right now than certainly I would like to see. And my hope is that in the early days of this transition and then of the administration, they go out of their way to put uncertainty back to the normal baseline yeah. equilibrium mm -hmm. and bring it off of where it is right now, which is that some of the treaty-based uh, assurances that people around the world have just awakened every morning to assume are there as stable pillars are not actually being called into question. And, and I would follow up with an optimistic note, too, is that his campaign, unlike many other campaigns, was not deep in terms of a reservoir of foreign affairs talent advising him and providing perspective. Uh, and my hope would be that he is now going to have a very deep dive into the reality of the relationship in that part of the world and will be in a position kind of coming into the office to have a much more um, direct view um, that's more than just a rhetorical comment. Swamps and reservoirs. Now we're going to go to the gentleman in the second row. I believe you're speaking and you're going to ask a question in Arabic. Yes, please. Okay. So they're yours. I've got them. Anna, Dr. Dr. Nawaf uh, from uh, uh, Studies Centers in the Shoujiao Police. Ms. Johnson, uh, you said uh, that economic and cultural stagnation has greatly contributed and directly contributed to the election of President elect Trump. So the economic factor has played an important role in the Trump victory in contracts. If we were link, to link that with internal uh, politics, we can link that to the uh, Brexit. And knowing that the EU was based on an economic uh, idea about World War II. So if this Union, European Union were to be dismantled, do you think that the conflict will once again be economic? And do you think that uh, this will uh, have an impact on uh, the influence regions and will influence regions like our region and uh, Southeast Asia? A question on the economic impact. But it raises a really important point about economic stagnation because there, there are lots of countries uh, in Europe uh, where, where Cher and I live that uh, look enviously on uh, the US economy and they wouldn't use the words economic stagnation. They look at near, uh, yeah, near record uh, unemployment levels, which they do jar with, Suzanne, your comment about labor participation. Maybe the, 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 the information and the statistics aren't filtering through for us to build a, a better picture. But what, are your wider, what is your wider take on this economic stagnation um, discussion in terms of the, you know, the future um, trajectory for this region? I think it's a very, very thoughtful and important question uh, because if you think about the role of technology going forward and its potential to displace many jobs in any part of the world, whether it's developed or emerging, but you know, Europe would be no different presumably, it means that it's going to be incumbent upon national governments in Europe, not just the EU, to basically to make sure that their population have both the safety nets that they need and also the opportunity in retooling during a time of tremendous change. Now, again, I think the good news is that between Brexit uh, and the US election um, and many of the elections so far on the continent, uh, which have to have given people pause uh, already, uh, that they're going to have to start responding. And if, even if you look at Germany and some of the things that have been done there very proactively uh, by the chancellor and their government in response to some of the pressure on the society from the immigration question, uh, I think you will see some governments that try to be responsive to this issue and to try to get ahead of it. But I don't think this issue is going away for any of these economies. Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay, well, let's, um, we have two more minutes. I don't want to uh, not, not use your time, frankly. Now, we're an organization that looks, looks to the future, and we believe in positivity. We believe in the challenges being solved. Um, and I don't want you to cast a judgment on whether you think the events of last week were good or bad. But give us grounds for optimism. One thing, one good thing that you think will happen. Doug, you're, you're grimacing the most, so I'm going to ask you to start. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I, I, <clears throat> I actually thought long and hard about this. I anticipated this question. So I did come up with at least one um, <laughs> positive outcome. Uh, look, I think that the uh, divide in the Republican Party and to some degree the divide in the Democratic Party uh, means that you have a president-elect Trump whose policies are you know, wildly uh, at odds with what has been the impediment to getting anything done in Congress for the Obama administration, which was this sense of having to pay for everything, that there was not going to be any fiscal expansion, uh, and that that meant nothing could get done without it being offset by something else, much of which could not happen under the existing rules, so you had stagnation. Uh, you could make a very strong case that under the policies that Trump has actually advocated, in particular infrastructure spending, that this could end up being a bipartisan effort in Congress to support this with Democrats and Republicans, not the entirety of both houses and not the entirety of both parties, but supporting a Trump administration initiative to spend money to address, address real needs. That actually could break down this impediment to having Democrats vote for anything that Republicans vote for and vice versa. If you could create that center, for want of a better phrase, then you could actually see more of what was historically the way Congress worked, which was you had some Democrats and some Republicans cooperate with the administration on shared goals and a means to achieve them that were not purely seen through partisan eyes. So, you know, ironically, Donald Trump, who was a divisive political figure, could be a catalyst for breaking down some of the absolute partisan barriers within Congress. Cheryl. I actually agree, I th having, having just come from the administration um, and being part of an, of an agency that we had tremendous bipartisan support. I think there were many days we might have been the only thing that they all agreed about, was because we provided an option that, that they could both, some of both parties could get on board with. And I do think that infrastructure, I agree, I think infrastructure is one that both sides have wanted to support. It certainly is a gap that needs to be filled. It will require grappling with some knock-on large challenges, right? How are we really gonna pay for it? That may open up some conversations that we never got to. And so I do think that the, the idea of finding common ground that we haven't been able to find by, by, by having parts of the parties both looking for a way forward could be quite productive. Um, you know, I, I do worry that there are places in our longer term investment in research and things like that that may be the place that does pay the price though in terms of either um, not paying off something in the short term to, uh, to your original point, Suzanne, um, or being um, more expendable than, than other things in order to make the, um, the group of voters happier in the short term. So I, that is my worry, but I do think there might be a, a real potential. Suzanne. Uh, and I guess I, I agree with my colleagues that infrastructure investment is the place that could be a silver lining in terms of bipartisan. I guess the other thing I'm optimistic about is this is the first time in a long time uh, that one party is now on the line uh, and has nowhere to hide to try to get something done. So the Republicans basically have the presidency, they have both houses, and they're gonna have, probably have the ability to appoint at least one Supreme Court justice. And there is no question that they made a lot of promises and there's a lot of expectations. And as you all probably know, Congress has got one of the lowest approval ratings of any institution uh, in the United States. So they are now on the line. And my hope is that that transparency and that consolidation of power uh, now makes it possible uh, to get some things done and log jams broken. Yeah. One other thing that, that I am hopeful about that I was being really depressed about in the past couple of days is that despite all of this divisive rhetoric through this entire campaign, we had the lowest voter turnout in history. And, and I find that to be just so sobering that despite that, that not being able to get people to step up and vote and my hope is that in all of this, as both parties and, um, and third parties grapple with um, why, um, why so many people are choosing not to participate, that we get ourselves as we move through the, the midterms and the next election to a better place. Um, 
I don't know the path, but, but despite all of this, I think it's having a lot of soul searching. And I think that that's good for the democratic process. I think it will be ultimately good for the United States. Well, thank you. Look, we've uh, taken up lots of time. I mean, I think soul searching is the, uh, the order of the day. We're still in that uh, phase, but we're, how soon we move on to genuine coalition building and, and moving away from transactional to strategic planning and um, breaking those log jams, I think that's the, the big question. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you for joining us um, here in the audience and also those of you watching us live online, weforum.org. This session is now finished. <laughs>